In this last content video for this module, I want to look at determining the equilibrium constant from Q, the other Q. I know you've been waiting breathlessly since the last video to know what's the other Q. And so, so far in this module, Q has been the reaction quotient. I want to remind you about an earlier friend named Q, and that would be the partition function. So, here is the general reaction that we've been playing with the whole module long. At constant t and v, so now I'll use t and v instead of t and p, by exact analogy to video 12.1, I can write the differential of the Helmholtz free energy as equal to all the individual chemical potentials times the differential of the number of moles of the reactants and products. At equilibrium, again, by, by exact analogy, I'm going to have the free energy of reaction. It's a Helmholtz free energy of reaction, but the free energy of reaction is equal to zero, and it is given by the stoichiometry coefficients and chemical potentials. And now, if we could relate the chemical potential to the partition function, we'd be able to get the equilibrium constant from the partition function, because we know how to relate the equilibrium constant to the free energy. So it is, of course, a little annoying that they're both called Q, and you just have to remember which one is which and what, what you're working with. So the, the reaction quotient is one Q, the partition function is another Q. In this video, I'm really interested in the partition function. <clears throat> So let's go back to some old friends, ideal gases. So for a mixture of ideal gases, all the constituents are independent. And so, right, that's the definition of an ideal gas. They don't interact with each other. So the system partition function is separable, right? So the partition function for everything, Na and B, and so it depends on Na and B and Y and Z, volume and temperature, can be expressed as the product of the partition functions for each of the individual species. And because they're ideal gases, the partition function for the entire species will be equal to the partition function for the molecule raised to the number that there are power divided by that number factorial because they're indistinguishable. And for each of these constituents, we've worked out previously that the chemical potential is minus RT partial, the log of the partition function, partial the number, okay, which is minus RT, so I'll just make the substitution, Q sub I, the molecular partition function, divided by N sub I, the total number, where we've used Stirling's approximation for N factorial, and if you want to see a a more complete derivation, you can go back to 9.7. And so now what I want to do is I want to make the connection to the equilibrium constant. So I'm going to substitute in for all of these chemical potentials the expression that depends on the molecular partition function. And there's a little self-assessment involved here. What I'd like you to do is show that that substitution will lead to this expression. Of course, getting to that final expression involves a certain amount of derivation, and so here it is in gory detail, and hopefully it looks just like whatever you've jotted down. I'll give you a chance to make that comparison. So now that you've proved the expression here in the yellow box, namely that the ratios of the molecular partition functions raised to respective stoichiometric powers are equal to the ratios of the individual numbers of molecules raised to stoichiometric powers. Let's divide all the n's by v's to give a number density rho, but 
that's a concentration, right? Number per volume is a concentration. And so that will give us an expression in Kc. And just to see how that's working, so Kc is the ratio of the concentrations. That's the definition of Kc. We'll now write, instead of concentration, density. It's just another symbol. It's exactly the same thing. That's equal to N over V. And so given this equality, it must be the case that Kc is equal to this, where I've also divided this side over V. So Kc is equal to the partition function of y divided by the total volume raised to the stoichiometric power associated with y, et cetera, for z, divided by that for a, divided by that for b. And, oh my gosh, that's the equilibrium constant from molecular partition functions, right? This is, this is not measuring anything. I'm not putting anything in a flask. All I need to know is those things that we know go into determining molecular partition functions, which is molecular weight, moments of inertia to deal with the rotational part, vibrational frequencies to deal with the vibrational part. So if I can find those in a book somewhere, I can actually predict for a given chemical reaction. I'll just form the partition functions, plug them in, and know what the equilibrium constant is. I'm I'm sort of staggered that one can do that and very excited and I'm sort of hoping everyone watching is too because it's really a remarkable power of statistical mechanics to in principle be able to do that. Does it work? I guess that's what we should ask. Does it work? Let's do an example. So here's hydrogen plus iodine, both as gases, reacting to make two molecules of hydrogen iodide gas. This is another one to be conducted in a fume hood. And so from what we had on the last slide, the equilibrium constant in concentration units will be partition function over V, partition squared, because we've got two of them, partition function over V for hydrogen, partition function over V for iodine. Okay? And so I will note that volume drops out in this case, right? I've got a 1 over V squared in the numerator. I've got two 1 over Vs in the denominator. It's just ratio of partition functions. If you go a long way back in all these videos to 4.6, you will see the full expression for an ideal diatomic gas. The molecular partition function depends on the mass of the two atoms in the diatomic, the symmetry number, the rotational temperature, the vibrational temperature, and the dissociation energy. And so if I take all of these, if I plug in for each of these quantities, the appropriate expression shown here, where now that there's a subscript HI, that's gonna mean I need the mass of hydrogen and the mass of iodine in the numerator. When I do it in the denominator, I'll have the mass of a hydrogen and the mass of a hydrogen. And so what you find is sure enough, here's the ratio of the masses raised to a certain power. Here's the rotational temperature, so there's some rotation, and it's 1 over, so it looks as though the reactants will appear in the numerator, and the products in the denominator, and the symmetry numbers give me an extra factor of 4, because the symmetry number is 2 for these two species, it's 1 for hydrogen iodide, and so on. I'm just going to keep taking all these different things, canceling common terms, they all have degeneracies of 1 in their electronic ground state. Uh, you end up with this expression. And again, I can get this entirely from quantized molecular energy levels. I just need to know what are the vibrational frequencies, what is the rotational temperature, that's a classical approximation, and finally, what's the dissociation energy? Well, here I brought it all over onto the slide again, and now I'm going to show you the results. This is log of the equilibrium constant as a function of 1 over t, so I'm going to evaluate this. These are all constants, right? N nothing changes in here except T. So the mass doesn't change as a function of temperature. The rotational temperature, does, it, it's a constant. It doesn't change. T appears in these expressions, and that's why the equilibrium constant changes with temperature, and it also appears here. So I will just plug in all the relevant constants and a given temperature and put down points uh, for the uh, 
I, I won't put down points, I'll draw a curve for this expression. So that's this solid curve. The points are actually physically measured values of the equilibrium constant at these temperatures. So somebody filled the flask with these very unpleasant gases and did the relevant measurement. And what you find is that there is stunning agreement at the right-hand side. And so this is 1,000 Kelvin over T. So as this is getting bigger, T is getting smaller, okay? Because T is in the denominator. So it says that at lower temperatures, I get amazing agreement from statistical mechanics with this bulk thermodynamic measurement. And then as I go to higher and higher temperatures, I eventually start to fall off and have a little bit less agreement. And the reason for that is at very high temperatures, the rigid rotator and the harmonic oscillator approximations that are being used in these partition functions begin to break down. Right, there's actually coupling between the rotation and the vibration. It just gets a little bit more complicated what the energy levels are, and that affects the partition functions. But from a practical standpoint, you've got to go pretty high, right? This is one in units of 1,000 Kelvin divided by temperature. So this is 1,000 Kelvin. That is a really hot vessel, 800 Celsius more or less, sorry, 700 Celsius more or less. Um, so it's not until you get to very, very high temperatures you break down. And we could ask, incidentally, remember, this is how you go about determining the enthalpy of reaction, which will be useful, say, in getting the free energy of reaction. So the curve generated just from the partition function gives you a value of minus 12.9 kilojoules per mole. Fitting a line to these points, which isn't shown here, but there is some best fit line. Remember, it's the Van Hoff equation, which is why you want to fit the line gives minus 13.4. So the agreement is to within half a kilojoule per mole up to a, a very high temperature. And so that is a remarkable indication, I would say, of just how powerful the partition function can be in learning things about macroscopic chemical systems. Okay, I will curb my excitement now and uh, we can go on and look at a review of the material in this 12th module.